We begin module 5, which is going to deal with protein ligand interactions in this course of fundamentals of protein chemistry. In the five lectures that we will have in this module, we will speak of the types of protein ligand interactions, the kinetics and thermodynamics, some experimental aspects, theoretical aspects, and then a discussion class where we will be looking at specific problems relating to this. In our discussion, we will be looking at the importance of protein ligand binding, what we mean by reversible binding, allosteric proteins, cooperative and complementary binding. In the specific binding sites that are present in proteins, we will be revisiting this topic when we study enzyme substrate complexes as well, which is a very important part of protein ligand binding. In the binding of ligands to a macromolecule, our lectures will cover the general description of ligand binding, the essentials, the thermodynamics, and the binding constants, the dissociation constants that are important in determining the strength of the protein ligand binding, the equilibrium binding in terms of the stoichiometry that occurs in protein ligand binding, the equilibrium binding and dissociation constants. This will be followed by complex equilibrium binding where we will be looking at specific known plots such as the scattered plot that give us an indication of the number of binding sites in a molecule followed by other protein ligand binding models and models for cooperative binding. When we look at binding of ligands to a macromolecule, the important quote which was given by Linus Pauling at the 25th anniversary of the Institute of Molecular Biology at the University of Oregon, he mentions that the secret of life is molecular recognition and the ability of one molecule to recognize another through weak bonding interactions. This is exactly what occurs in protein ligand binding. When we look at protein ligand binding, we have a ligand, which is typically a small molecule that binds to the protein in a non-covalent manner. The binding site on the specific protein or macromolecule of interest is a region of the protein where this ligand with, will bind a very specific binding, which is more so when we see enzyme substrate complexes later when we have our module on enzymes. This will depend upon the steric complementarity and the geometric complementarity as well as the chemical complementarity in the active site. Proteins themselves, as we know, are dynamic molecules whose functions invariably depend upon the interactions with the other molecules. So whether we have this small ligand binding to the protein or we are looking at another protein that is coming to interact in a protein-protein interaction or even protein DNA or protein RNA interaction, the interactions are important in terms of the types of interactions that can be formed. We know these are weak, non-covalent types of interactions. So we form the protein plus the ligand, we form the protein ligand complex. In the formation of the complex, we have these intermolecular interactions that can be electrostatic interactions, van der Waals interactions, or hydrophobic interactions, as we have seen before when we have looked at the protein folding characteristics that occur in the specific interactions or the folding interactions between the amino acids and the overall folding. In this case, we are looking at a small molecule, a ligand, that is coming to bind with the protein at a specific site on the protein. The protein-ligand interactions are crucial to biological function. They function in communication, such as hormones, neurotransmitters, second messengers, downstream regulators, in protein trafficking, where 
and prosthetic groups and defense and offense where we have bacterial toxins come into the picture. When we look at the different binding models that are possible for proteins, a common model is the lock and key model, which is common more so in enzyme substrate, but similarly that it is there in protein ligand binding models. So the enzyme substrate interactions or the enzyme substrate binding is a subset of a protein ligand binding. What we have in this case is we have a typical active site on the protein and we have on the ligand or the small molecule a perfect match to the active site giving us a lock and key method given by Emil Fischer a long time ago in the lock and key method of ligand protein, protein ligand binding or enzyme substrate binding. In terms of an induced fit model, when we have a specific active site, it remodels itself to accommodate the substrate. This is Koshland model where we look at the active site residues that remodel themselves or orient themselves in such a fashion so that the substrate can be accommodated into the active site. Another case that we look at is a conformational selection where the proteins can shift spontaneously between different conformations. In this case, what we can have is we can have a specific fit or it may so happen that we have another conformation and as the substrate comes, there is an equilibrium between this conformation and the other conformation where the active site residues are have a different, different geometric pattern to them. This is followed by the appearance of the ligand, following which there is an accommodation of the ligand into the specific pocket where the ligand binding will occur. Let us look at some specific examples. In this case, we are looking at a catalysis an enzyme substrate and cofactor binding, an extremely important aspect of protein ligand binding in general. In this case, we are looking at N-phenylalanine dehydrogenase. Once we get to our enzyme discussions, we will know what this dehydrogenase means. This is the enzyme that is given in the blue ribbon here. We recognize from the structure that these are the strands that form the beta sheet and these are the helices that are there in the protein and these connectors are the random coils or the specific turns or linkers that link the secondary structural elements together. Here we see that there is a cofactor which is NADH that is colored in orange. In this case, the substrate that is colored by the atom type which is N-phenylalanine, is present at the active site. And we have both the substrate and the cofactor bound to this specific enzyme. This binding will occur through non-covalent interactions, particularly for enzyme substrate complexes, because for the reaction to occur in the product formation, as we will see later on, we do not want the enzyme to bind to the substrate too strongly because then it will not release the substrate or will not release the product form if the binding is too tight. However, we will see for the design of inhibitors, we would like a strong binding to occur. So an enzyme activator inhibitor in this case will also be looking at allosteric regulators where what we mean by this is a binding to a site that is not the active site of the protein. Now this has important implications in a regulation of the active site. The active site residues may not bind to the activator or inhibitor. So it would be another site on the protein or the enzyme that would bind to this regulator that would in turn affect the functionality of the enzyme in terms of its binding to the substrate. 
in this particular picture figure we see fructose one six dis phosphatase with 2,5 anhydro D glucitol 1,6 bisphosphate marked with AHG here, and which is a substrate analog, and AMP, which is an allosteric inhibitor. If this is a substrate analog, this means that this is binding to the active site, but it is not the substrate, it is an analog of the substrate, and this AMP is an allosteric inhibitor binding to a site other than the active site, but it is going to affect the binding of the substrate. So the allosteric ligand occupies a distinct binding site that is distant from the catalytic site. We look at transporters, channel transporters or ions or molecules. Here we have an ATP binding site, a specific substrate binding site on this molecule. And this is what we will look at later on in one of our lectures, where we will look at a specific substrate binding site, an ATP binding site, where we again see that the ATP binding site is remote from the substrate binding site. So the key aspects in protein ligand binding are the affinity, how strong is the binding, and its specificity. How specific is the binding? In the affinity, there are different types of complexes that may be formed. And it is important to understand how the binding energy may be measured and calculated. So we need to understand the thermodynamics of the specific binding. For the specificity, specificity there are specific models determinants and promiscuity where we can design analogs that if we know a particular function of the protein, knowing, say for an enzyme, we know the specific substrate, we can prepare substrate analogs that would then bind to the active site acting as inhibitors. Now, this transient nature of protein ligand interactions is critical to life because it allows an organism to respond rapidly and reversibly to changing environment and metabolic circumstances. So what we are looking at is we look at reversible binding of a protein to a ligand because we would want our protein to function to be available for a lab, another ligand to bind to it. We look at allosteric binding where we have the small molecule bind to a site other than the active site of the protein. A cooperative binding of a protein to a ligand and a complementary binding of a protein to a ligand. So in all these types of binding, we look at a transient nature that occurs due to the non-covalent nature of the binding that is observed. In reversible protein ligand binding, our receptor, that could be the protein, could be an enzyme, or any other macromolecule, say for example DNA, we have a small ligand, relatively small molecule, that could be an ion in ion transport, could be a small molecule, could be a substrate where we have enzymes as our receptors, or could be a cofactor. Now, this reversibility is important so that we have our enzyme or our protein or our other macromolecule available to other ions or small molecules or substrates or cofactors so that we have a continuous biochemical process that occurs. The biochemical reactions that occur may continue to occur because of the reversible protein ligand binding, making our receptor available for other small molecules to bind. The most common example of reversible binding of a protein to a ligand is the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. We have deoxyhemoglobin. Here are the four, we know that hemoglobin is a tetrameric molecule with two alpha and two beta subunits. 
each of them have a heme group which has an iron. So these are the heme groups that are marked in red here. And here we have deoxyhemoglobin that does not have oxygen bound to it. Now we have a specific you know, IHP binding site. We will look at this later on when we look at the binding of hemoglobin. But when we are looking at the binding of dioxygen to hemoglobin, we'll see that this occupies a site present here and the oxygen binds to a site that is near the iron atom of the heme molecule. Myoglobin, which is a monomeric protein, on the other hand, has a single binding site for the oxygen. Here we see the heme for the myoglobin and this is the iron atom. Another example here is where we have triose phosphate isomerase, where we have a complex with the glycerol phosphate. So there is the active site and we have the cleft where we have the molecules bound. In specific cases like this, we have active site residues that are involved in the recognition. As we will look at specific enzyme mechanisms, we will see that there are specific sites that recognize specific moieties on the substrate molecule, be it a sugar molecule or a base or a phosphate. In this case, it could be the phosphate, which is recognized by the active site in the binding of this compound. When we are looking at a complex of a protein with even drugs, the idea here is that we are looking at the H in this particular diagram here. We are looking at the HIV protease complex with SD146, which is a drug. The idea is looking at the open and closed format and see, seeing how the binding of the drug is going to affect this conformational change that is essential for the activity. This is protein ligand binding. We can also look at DNA binding, where we have DNA binding proteins that often fit into the major groove of the double helix, as we can see here, where we have, we know that in the study of the nucleic acids, where we know that we have a sugar phosphate backbone and these are the bases. A study of the nucleic acid structure tells us that this is highly negatively charged because of the phosphate groups. And we have these bound proteins to the major groups of the double helix, giving us again a protein ligand binding format where our ligand in this case is the DNA. An allosteric protein is one where we have the binding of a ligand to one site that affects the binding properties on another site on the same protein, as we saw in one of the previous slides. In this case, the active site which is available for the substrate or for the specific ligand that is you that is essential for the function of the protein in the binding for the function of the protein to be performed. We have now another small molecule that is bound to another site that affects the binding of the ligand to the protein. So the term allosteric derives from the Greek allos, that is other, and stereos, that is another solid or shape. So it is another area in which we have a binding of another small molecule that is going to affect the binding of the original substrate or ligand or the common substrate or ligand to the protein. One such example is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This is a molecule that greatly reduces the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. 
there is an inverse relationship between the binding of oxygen and the binding of PPG, as this is called. This is the structure of 2,3-bis phosphoglycerate. And it is interesting to note that the presence of this molecule reduces the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So our body responds in a manner when there is less oxygen available, say, for example, at increased heights, where increased elevation, where the level of oxygen is low, bisphosphoglycerate is formed to reduce the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. If we look at the structure of where the bisphosphoglycerate binds, it is different from where oxygen binds. So there is a regulation by the BPG in this particular structure where we are looking at the heme moieties here that would bind the oxygen. The presence of the 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate here, or diphosphoglycerate as it is also called, reduces the affinity for oxygen by hemoglobin. We will look at the binding of this. It is an extremely interesting way that nature creates this reduction in the affinity for oxygen when oxygen levels are low. Here is where we have oxygen bound and here we can see where 2, 3 BPT is bound. Which means that this is binding to a site that is not affecting the binding of oxygen but nevertheless reduces the affinity of hemoglobin to bind the oxygen. When we look at complementary interactions between proteins and ligands, a very important aspect is the immune system and immunoglobulins, antibody-antigen interactions, which we will study in greater detail when we look at protein-protein interactions, large molecule interactions. The immune system is extremely important in the elimination of viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens and molecules that may pose a threat to the organism. This is where our immune system comes to play. On a physiological level, the immune system is actually an integrator, the immune response that is triggered is an integrated and coordinated set of interactions among many classes of proteins, molecules, and cell types. Now, an understanding of the modes of action is beyond this course in the terms of how the T cells and the B cells are are triggered in an immune response. But the fact that we have a protein ligand binding, a specific interaction that occurs at the molecular level is what of interest. The immune response consists of two complementary systems. One is the humoral system and the other is a cellular immune system. In the humoral immune system, this is directed at bacterial infections and extracellular viruses that are found in body fluids but could also respond to individual foreign proteins. At the heart of the humoral immune response are the soluble proteins called antibodies or immunoglobulins, often abbreviated Ig. There are different types of immunoglobulins. And what we have here is a diagram of this specific immunoglobulin where we are looking at IgG, immunoglobulin G, that is binding to an antigen, which is the small molecule that we see here. 
Now, what is important is the structure of the antibody is such. It is a Y-shaped molecule with specific disulfide linkages. And the geometric complementarity that we see here in the binding of the antigen to the antibody is extremely important in forming the tight antigen antibody complex that is extremely important to fight off disease. When you look at a cellular immune system, we are looking at a system that destroys host cells infected by viruses and also destroys parasites and foreign tissues. The agents at the heart of the cellular immune response are a class of T cells that are known as cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxics means they are toxic to the cells. Now, how do we measure all this binding? The binding can be measured by a method known as equilibrium dialysis. In this case, as an experimentalist, we know the total amount of substrate. We know the total amount of bound substrate. Now, there can be specific biophysical techniques. For example, we could have a specific absorbance, a specific signal from the molecule that would tell us that there is a conformational change due to the binding of a ligand with the substrate. If, for example, we had a tryptophan molecule or a tryptophan amino acid present at the active site of a protein or at a cleft in the protein and we would be interested to know whether our ligand is binding to that specific site. We would look at a fluorescence signal. The fluorescence signal for the protein in the unbound state would give us a complete signal that would be quenched when the ligand would bind to the specific site where the tryptophan moiety is present. We will see these when we look at the specific binding in terms of the equilibrium binding kinetics and thermodynamics as to how the ligand binds to our macromolecule of interest. In an equilibrium dialysis method, we had looked at the method of dialysis in a previous lecture where we looked at protein purification. The specific dialysis membrane is such that it has a molecular weight cutoff. Our macromolecule of interest is present in the dialysis bag. Our bound, our unbound substrate is in the solution that surrounds it. Placing our bag with the macromolecule in this particular solution allows the substrate molecules, because they are smaller in size, to penetrate the dialysis membrane and bind to our macromolecule. Based on observations, we can determine many aspects. One is we can see whether the enzyme or our protein has a bound substrate to it by a spectroscopic signal. We can look at the concentration of the substrate outside the bag, which would tell us the amount equilibrium un amount of unbound substrate. Given that we know the total amount of substrate, we can find the total amount of bound substrate because we know that the total amount of substrate is either free or in the bound state. So if we look at a specific example, 
where we have, say, an enzyme and we have a ligand that is going to bind to it. We are looking at a signal of absorbance at a specific wavelength. As the ligand is gradually bound to the enzyme, there is another signal that emerges because of the ligand bound to the enzyme. What can be done in this case is what is called a titration. That means different cons. So this would be the pure enzyme or the pure macromolecule. As we add the ligand, we have a reduction in the intensity at this particular wavelength. And we have an intensity of the enzyme ligand complex emerge and increase as the ligand is bound to the enzyme. So this can be monitored. So we can monitor the titration of the enzyme with the ligand at a suitable wavelength where the absorbance change is large. And at any given wavelength, the total absorbance is the sum of the absorbance contribution from each of the species that we have. In this way, we can monitor and we can see how we can actually determine the binding constants, which will be the subject of the next lecture. So if we look at the bindings of the ligands to the macromolecule, we have a general description. The essentials in the knowledge that we know that we have non-covalent interactions that contribute to this ligand binding. And we will be looking at what we mean by equilibrium binding, the stoichiometric titrations, and how we can determine the equilibrium binding or dissociation constants. And we can also look at some complex binding situations where we could have a larger number of binding sites, which would give us different protein ligand binding models and also cooperative binding. These are the references. Thank you.